So welcome to another episode of From Garage to Growth. And this is the podcast where we venture into the entrepreneurship space and we look at the movers and shakers within this space. And I'm your host, Brian. And today my guest is Dr. Salma. She's the founder and CEO of Remy, a deep tech startup revolutionizing molecular diagnostics in undeserved regions within Middle East and Africa. And she has a background in pharmacy and biotechnology. She has not only exceeded in academia, but has moved within the entrepreneurship space. So to kind of get things started, I'd just like to give you the floor for you to introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit of who is Dr. Song. Thank you, O'Brien, for the introduction, which is a uh, very kind words, actually. So, um, yeah. So, uh, as you indicated, so I started, uh, I started, I studied pharmacy as undergraduate studies, and then I pursued the master's and a PhD in Germany because I, I like research a lot. So um, growing up in a developing country, when you like research, you start thinking that basic research is more of a luxury. Yes, it's very important. I don't want to be like misunderstood. But when you have a lot of pressing problems that are inherent to your region, you really want to use science and solving of these problems. So when I decided to study, I decided to go for applied science, especially one that would put a product on the table. So after completing my PhD in Germany, I then came back to Egypt because again, the main goal was to employ science in solving of our own problems. And uh, I joined academia, stayed in academia for, I would say around eight years. Uh, this came with its own set of challenges. So for example, uh, applying for grants in the EU, publications and so forth was a lot easier just because I had a German affiliation, for example, at the time. But the moment I moved back to Egypt, despite being the same person, it it become, I would say at least 10 times harder because of the affiliation that came with being located in Africa. Yeah. Anyway, um, the game changer for me, honestly, was COVID. So uh, in Egypt, uh, at the start of the COVID pandemic, you could not really get tested for COVID. And I would say this extended uh, up until the second half of 2020. And when you could get tested for COVID, you would only do it in specific private locations where it was super expensive, or you had to queue in only one or two governmental locations and if you probably did not have COVID, you will catch COVID in the line because it was super crowded. Yeah. So the Egyptian government launched a, a request in, uh, for the development of COVID diagnostics. And uh, honestly, I mustered up my courage and uh, was able to form like a local consortium of a couple of governmental hospitals, private labs, and we were able to deploy a test within nine months. But when we started developing the test, we did not just want to develop a test. We wanted to develop a test that was more affordable, that was available at point of care, that would actually be suited to where we are. Because if we developed a test that was expensive, that needed to be frozen, that needed complicated laboratories, this wouldn't work. So um, we set on and we, and we did it for COVID. And honestly, this was the game changer for me. Um, yes, within the scope of academia, um, it provided some sort of a comfort zone for me to be able to pursue that. But academia comes with its own restrictions, especially in our region. So I decided to quit academia and found Remedy. And at Remedy, this is what we do, not just for COVID. We develop diagnostic tests that are specifically suited for use in low resource setting. Okay. So, so you, you spoke about your, your initial uh, like in conception of, oh, you were in the line and you saw that there's an issue that needs to be solved. What was that initial spark that you were like, that motivated you to in terms of going, oh, yes, this is a problem and I have the solution for it. And that is Remy. So um, the thing is that um, you always, so as an academic, yes, you believe in your science and everything, but you also, you know, lack the skill set to go and commercialize it. And then you also, there, this also comes, you know, when you develop something, this also comes with this imposter syndrome. It's like, really, did I do it? Did it work? Am I able to? But then when we deployed this test, it was used by uh, one of the very big governmental hospitals. It was also used by the university where I worked in. And this, you know, gave me the confidence to actually, you know, believe in myself, believe that, yes, we can take science to another level and we can actually put a product on the table. Um, within the scope of academia, I honestly tried, you know, the concept of spin-offs is very popular in Europe. The concept of spin-offs is less popular, I would say, in Egypt. Um, universities come with a very heavy admin, uh, with a lot of bureaucracy in decision making. Um, again, um, where I worked, it was a private university. It was not a public governmental university. And at the end of the day, they had to generate profits and generating the profits came from undergraduate student teaching. So they prioritized teaching to research. 
And once you see that you can actually do something that helps people, you think it would be such a waste, just stay in my comfort zone and not try. Yes, it came with a big risk. I remember the university, uh, the faculty dean actually telling me that I was throwing my career away by actually quitting my academic position. But honestly, uh, you have to try. I mean, uh, if you don't take the risk, then you don't go anywhere. Yeah. So, so was Remy's uh, initial uh, like mission or goal that you wanted to, to achieve? On your website, you kind of cater to the notion of you want to create a better and healthier and cleaner future for all. So how do you guys manifest this idea within the day-to-day -day operations of the business and when you make decisions? Okay. So, um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, we are mainly looking at underserved markets. So for the time being, Middle East and Africa, hopefully in the future, maybe Southeast Asia, Latin America, but the time being Middle East and Africa. And if we look at the region, I would say in terms of molecular diagnostics per se, which is like PCR test uh, sequencing and similar techniques. Unfortunately, to date, no one is developing for the region or no one is manufacturing for the region. So big companies that come from the US or the EU or uh, for price purposes, maybe China, uh, they deploy their tests that were developed for the developed world to function in the region. And because they were developed to function in the developed world, so they automatically are not optimally fitted to fit what the region needs. So for, for instance, they are super expensive to start with. Uh, they mostly need to be frozen, which means that their shipping and transport becomes very complicated. And if you want to, you know, increase the accessibility of testing and make testing, for example, available in the small villages in Africa, you cannot have uh, a minus 80 freezer in every location. Yes. Also, the protocols are pretty long and they require, I would say, heavily equipped clubs and they required highly trained personnel. And I'm not saying that Africa does not have skilled people. They do. They do have skilled people. But because of the limited opportunities, they opt to go elsewhere where they have better circumstances. And end of the results, when you look at the lab and the medical facilities, they are less staffed, they are less mm -hmm. equipped, and they need something else. So when we decided to start developing our products, we wanted to target these issues. So we wanted our tests to be room temperature stable so that you can ship and store at room temperature. We wanted our testing protocols to be shorter. So in case that you have a limited amount of equipment, you can at least double or triple the productivity by using the equipment to a small, in a lesser, um, to reduce, uh, I would say, the time of the test. And uh, we also wanted to make the protocol simpler so that you, uh, they are less labor intensive. And this is what we did. And today we have launched products for testing of hepatitis C, hepatitis B, HIV, tuberculosis. And we are recently going to launch a test for um, um, the human papilloma virus infection with a specific focus on cervical cancer. Because I would say that women's health is, is a completely different story that we can maybe spend hours speaking about and how it is deprioritized, especially anything related to gynecological health, because this comes with a set of, I would say, uh, preconceived taboos and yeah. stigma that you also need to fight uh, fight for. So this is what we are doing. We develop and deploy tests that are suited for our region. And with that, we aim to increase accessibility and affordability of testing. We are also firm believers of giving back. So we are planning a couple of screening campaigns that we are going to cover. Uh, and we are continuously also looking for like, um, I would say, international organizations who are willing to support such screening campaigns because as, as a startup, we can only do it to a limited extent. But I mean, if we have more support, we can extend the benefit that comes out of it. Hmm. So, so you spoke about the initial struggle or the lack of belief that you, you yourself had, but the lack of belief that people around you had in terms of when you, you wanted to do this jump in the journey. And you spoke about the issues in terms of how Africa with regards to receiving medicine and, and so on. There's so many other issues that you have to go through. So when it goes to those initial challenges that you spoke about, how did you go about in terms of scaling Remy and how did you go about to the point where you felt confident around going, let me dive straight into this. Let me leave my academia and let me, this is something I want to work and this is an issue people need and let me go full on hundred percent with this idea. I would say early believers uh, make a very big difference in that sense. So um, when we had the decision of actually, yes, we are going to leave academia and we're going to start Remedy, you know, we needed someone else to believe in us so that we can believe in ourselves too. 
And um, at this point, uh, we started speaking to Oman Technology Fund. This is a VC firm in Oman. And we spoke to them about what we did with COVID and the ideas that we had for Remedy. And they honestly believed in us and they deployed initial funding. And with this initial funding, you know, we said, that if they believe in us, we have to believe in ourselves. If they give us their money, then we have to make this work. And for us, you know, this, this was the level of commitment we had to put in. It's like, this is not just us trying. If we fail, it's not just us failing. We bring those yeah. people with us and we have to make it work. So this was the initial push. Um, we were then, I would say, very lucky in the sense that we won a couple of prizes. For example, there was this initiative called She's Next uh, by Visa and a local bank in Egypt, CIB. Uh, and this is um, a program that supports women or female-led startups. And we were able to win after like competing with 4,000 Egyptian startups. And they also brought along an immense amount of support and PR. This exposure has, you know, connected us with like major game players in the regions. They have also, you know, put us in front of like, or brought us up in front of like um, a government regulatory officials. And this has a sped thing. So I would say that um, exposure is of utmost important. I think doing what we do, if we do this in stealth mode, this would have taken us nowhere. And uh, we have taken, you know, have put in a lot of effort into, you know, like bringing our message out there, saying that we can do this. And when you say you can do this, then a lot of supporters that, you know, didn't know you existed or didn't believe that someone can do it would actually stand in line and support you. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's definitely true. The lack of, so we spoke about uh, doing things in self mode or the lack of visibility. Do you feel that that has changed recently within the Egyptian ecosystem where there's more visibility being given to startups, especially we female-led startups specifically? I, I would say that if I would start with the second part of the question, yes, within the past couple of, not couple, maybe like five or six years, there has been focus into like supporting women entrepreneurs. So a lot of programs are directed towards um, female founders in terms of supporting them, um, even on like the, the emotional level, because, you know, being a female founder, for example, I am a mother, I am a wife, and I have a family to take care of. My family is extremely supportive, and I would say that I am very lucky in that sense. But uh, you also need support. You also need other people to know the struggles. You also need other people to say it's okay. Yes, we know what you're going through. And not to compare you to your male counterpart, for example, who does not have the same responsibilities that you have. So within that sense, the ecosystem in Egypt has evolved to support women. Uh, I would also say that for the past year, focus in Egypt has been on software, SaaS-based platforms. But uh, we, for two or three years now, we see an appetite for biotech. We see an appetite for companies that have like physical products. Because in healthcare, for example, yes, uh, I would say that like uh, tele, uh, telemedicine, e-commerce and all of that is very important, but where does the product come from? If you don't have a product, an Egyptian product, an African product, a local product, then this means that all of these platforms are commercializing, again, imported products, which does not solve your problems. So uh, I would say that the Egyptian ecosystem is changing. Uh, mm. It is supporting female entrepreneurs. And recently uh, they have developed an appetite for, I would say, riskier companies, such as those involved in the biotech area. Yeah, and I would just like to keep the conversation on Egyptian ecosystem. So recently in 2023, Egypt saw its first uh, unicorn. And so this kind of showcased the growth or within the, the, the ecosystem. Uh, in, your, in your take, what what's, what's been contributing to this uh, appetite within the Egyptian ecosystem with regards to focusing on tech specific uh, building tech hubs within Egypt? So, uh, yes, like you mentioned, um... We had our first unicorn uh, last year. We also had a couple of very successful exits, even if they were not unicorns yet. And this, um, from an investment perspective, has built confidence in the ecosystem. So for Egypt, and I'm sure for a lot of countries in the region, we are plagued by currency devaluations, by a lot of economical instability. And this maybe would be a little bit, you know, a lot of investors would shy away from it. But uh, when countries grow, despite that gives them a different level of resilience that, you know, if, if a company that 
has made it through in Egypt with all of the devaluations and economic circumstances, but now has a branch in the GCC, for example, or expanded to elsewhere, you know that this company will go a long way because of the resilience it has acquired. Um, the ecosystem has also grown in terms of there are a lot of acceleration products, uh, uh, sorry, uh, acceleration programs uh, that support entrepreneurs on different levels. And um, these programs also, maybe some of them are government backed, some of them are on a private level, but they have also, uh, they also have expanded their reach in terms of the distance they allow you to bridge has also become larger. And all of that have participated, you know, in Egypt booming in that sense. And on the notion, so a few years ago, I met with someone from Egypt, uh, I think it was one from the ambassador, and we're talking about how Egypt is focusing on smart cities, especially within tier two uh, cities specifically. How is the creation of programs like the Create Creativa, uh, how is that aimed to foster innovation within, let's say, uni public universities? And how cru crucial are those programs to kind of foster uh, entrepreneurship within universities and within Egypt uh, itself? We are actually part of the current cohort of plug and play, which is in creative. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. So, uh, yes. So with, within that cohort, how, how do you see people, the motivation in terms of building this ecosystem as it helped build the ecosystem in Egypt in terms of giving opportunities to people to be more like inclined to be you know, entrepreneurs rather than shifting to like, oh, let me find a job and so on. So I would say the support system is, uh, is pretty intense. Um, it's pretty amazing in that sense, because, uh, these programs do several things. So first of all, they, for example, someone like me coming out of academia and jumping into like the business world, you lack a lot of the things that you know, you should know as a business person. And in that sense, the educational content is amazing. It is also suited to the region. So we've also been part of programs in Europe. But because, you know, when you are an Egyptian startup, receiving the content that was developed for European startups, it is, yes, beneficial, but it's not, you know, I would say tailored to suit the ecosystem where you operate in because things are done differently in Africa. So uh, the content that is delivered by the programs in Egypt is very well suited to the Egyptian market and is also suited, you know, to the ecosystem in Africa, GCC and the Middle Eastern region. So the educational content is amazing. It's not just that, it's also suited to where you operate in. Second, the reach. So um, they have put us, I would say that the programs in the region has put us in contact with a lot of investors, a lot of VCs that had appetite for Egyptian companies, for African country, companies. So again, when we were doing similar programs in the EU, the majority of the VCs or the investors, you know, were very reluctant in going into emerging markets. But then the VCs that come through these other projects are investing in emerging markets. A lot of them are also impact investors. So if you bring something to the table, you know, other than generating profit and growth, they are also more interested in uh, like that. They are also uh, very well connected to government uh, and they facilitate uh, if you need, uh, for example, to have a meeting with some sort of governmental officials because you need some regulatory approvals or so forth, they also help you with that. And they expand your reach in, in terms of they allow you to go, for example, for news interviews. Uh, they know how to shine the spotlight on you in a way that would give you the exposure you need to actually grow. Yeah, which, which is nice. I think one of the big things that's lacking within the African ecosystem is visibility or platforms mm -hmm. where people are seen to, 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 to a degree. Because if you look at like the German ecosystem, there's a lot of platforms for, for startups or entrepreneurs to be in the same places with other entrepreneurs where they can share ideas and that kind of grows the ecosystem. And we, we're speaking about this lack of, let's say, capital risk inverse within the African ecosystem. What significant barriers do you see within, let's say, Egypt that are still present with regards to securing funding that can be improved? And what initiative do you want to see within the environment, let's say, uh, venture capital being so risk averse within investing within Africa? So again, I would say, yes, it's improving in, in terms that uh, not every VC now or every investor we speak to is looking for, um, uh, I would say, uh, a tech. Mm -hmm. One, I don't want to say tech-based program because we are tech. <laughs> we use nanotechnology, we use biotechnology, and this is something that has been hurting my feelings because then <laughs> we go into these interviews and there's like, so what tech do you use? 
Uh, do you use AI? No, we don't use AI, but we always <laughs> use tech. It's called biotechnology, for God's sake. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I would say that the conventional tech used to be the focus, the entire focus of actually, you know, being able to scale just, you know, by hiring more people and uh, having more like computers on the set. And this, this was a little bit limiting. But now there is an increased appetite for like biotech, manufacturing. And also one thing that I, I would really want to put out there. When we said manufacturing, a lot of the investors just jumped out of the window because when you say manufacturing, people, you assume that you have a factory that is a thousand meters squared, that it's acid heavy, and you need to sell a kidney to finance it. Mm. Um, but the thing is, um, not this, this is not, I would say, the standard for every single industry. So for instance, what we do, the secret lies in the formula, in the ingredients. But at the end of the day, our factory is like a 200 meter square factory, which is as big as a normal flat in Egypt. And it, it costs around $50,000 to establish. And we only have a couple of mixers. Yes, we are regulated. We have the relevant regulatory approvals. We have ISOs. We have GMP certificates. But we are not asset heavy. So maybe also a little bit, you know, of open mindedness in the sense of manufacturing does not automatically translate to asset heavy. Uh, to increase our manufacturing capacity, for instance, we don't need to double our manufacturing uh, facility, which means that you can still grow. You will not plateau out. So I think the existence of different manufacturing modules um, is, is something that we would like to put out there. Yeah, right. So as Egypt uh, evolves uh, th throughout its different initiation of ecosystem, what are some of the key areas that yeah. youth feel still need attention? And how can stockholders collaborate with each other to create a more inclusive environment with regards to inspiring entrepreneurs, bringing more people within the ecosystem? So uh, honestly, I think we touched on this point earlier. I think there are a lot of very, very interesting companies doing a lot of interesting things, but the lack of visibility makes us unaware of them. So for example, we are part of also this acceleration program. It's called Brain by Open Startups in Tunisia. And this is a pan-African program. And it was only through this program that we met another biotech company in South Africa. And they manufacture, for example, one of our raw materials that we import from abroad. So we generally use locally sourced materials up to 95%, but 5% of our raw materials is still imported from like EU or the US. We only came to know them because we were part of this program. So there isn't this kind of platform, you know, where when you are looking for something or for a solution in the region that you can access and look at and then reach out to these people. So I think the lack of visibility is still... Is still is still a very big issue in the sense that no one is actually doing what knowing what the other people is doing, and in that sense, you don't know how you can work together. So for, for you for you itself, looking at 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 Remy, what's your initial goal for let's say the next five to ten years? Where do you see the company, and where do you see yourself as a as a founder? Do you think you're going to jump onto let's say create another company? Or do, are you going to be working on Remy? Are you going to take a step back to be like, oh, let me give someone else to give it, to, to run it? So um, today we sell in Egypt, we sell in Sudan, we sell in Iraq. But mm -hmm. within this uh, five-year period, we are hoping to extend to the North African region, probably West Africa, of course, because this is like a huge market for us. And this is a case where the need is extremely high. For economic stability, we're also looking into a expansion into the GCC region. So within this five-year period, we are looking into expansion so that we can have like major presence within the Middle East and African region. Once we are there, I do not see myself as like exiting and enjoying my time on the beach. <laughs> I, uh, I see myself taking on another challenge. Hmm. So um, what we decided to do now when we started developing our tests, we did not want to invent the wheel. We wanted to see what tests are out there, why are they not suited for our region, and just develop the technology that made them suited for our region so that we can deploy these tests. This doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that we are incapable of producing novel tests that do not exist. They just come with a lot of risk. They come with a lot of, I would say, R&D cost that we are unable to bear at the moment. So first five years, we look at expansion Middle East and Africa. Second five years, we look into deploying new tests that are not out there, like novel testing. And uh, we would, yes, deploy them also in the region, but this would also give us a market entry into the EU, for example. Mm, nice. That, uh, that's, that's safety goals. So at the beginning of our conversation, we, we spoke about COVID-19. And I just want to touch on how the pandemic, to, to a degree, kind of 
opened the eyes in terms of how Africa is restricted uh, in terms of the vaccine apartheid as, as it was dubbed during that time and how as Africa to a degree was held ransom by big pharma and overcharged for COVID vaccine. So looking looking at that time, uh, with like wealthier nations uh, monopolizing this supply of COVID, COVID vaccines, Africa in particular faced like, significant challenges in, in acquiring affordable vaccines. And as, a, as a Africa consumes, let's say, 25% of the global vaccine and only produces 1%, uh, how could you kind of elaborate and see how these inequalities are kind of in, if affecting Africa and how can Africa become independent from big pharma and Western uh, countries? I would say self-sufficiency. This has to be the way. So um, there are a lot of... If, in, it, a lot of initiatives for technology transfer. For example, this mRNA technology hub that has happened in South Africa is also facilitating things. Mm -hmm. But um, again, um, yes, technology transfer is important and all of that, but we don't need technology transfer. We can also create our own technology. Africa has brilliant scientists, brilliant scientists, not just in the biotech area, in a lot of areas. It's just because of the lack of opportunities and because when you compare career options in Africa or if we go to the US or the EU, people are moving out. And this results in a brain drain in the region. So I would say that moving forward, uh, self-sufficiency has to be the way. Yes, technology transfer is an initial step, but uh, some sort of empowerment uh, for African scientists may be somehow creating the opportunities, creating, um, I would say, the comfortable environment for them to stay and solve their own problems. Our, I don't think that African problems are going to be solved by, you know, just transferring a technology that is developed for the US because the problems are different. The circumstances are different. Yes, it's a good starting point. I don't want to be misunderstood, but we have to start uh, producing our own materials. And within the pharma industry, if you look at pharma in specifically, it, you have a lot of pharmaceutical manufacturers in Africa, but I would say how many of them are actually creating the API, the actual active pharmaceutical ingredients? I would say close to none. And in that sense, this means that even if the pharma companies in Egypt are in, in Africa are progressing, they still need to import the active pharmaceutical ingredient from abroad, the one that actually treats this. So why aren't we looking at like localizing the entire process? Yes, it's harder. Yes, it's a stretch. Yes, it probably needs a lot of governmental financing and support. But I would say this is the only way of moving forward. And, and you spoke about uh, build, uh, building or producing African-centric products. Do you feel there's a mistrust within Africa itself or within the African community with regards to African-centric products? Because with the founders that I've spoken with, they feel like if, even if you bring, let's say you, you, you produce a product and it's African build and you give it to them and they're like, oh, it's, it's from Africa, but then they'll buy or any pro the same product, but from Western uh, uh, companies. They'll either buy that, but they'll shy away from the African-centric build product. I completely agree. And this is what we touched on in the beginning. I mean, even like an academic for grants and for publications. The mm -hmm. moment I stopped using my German affiliation, uh, the rate of paper acceptance was reduced. The rate of the ability to acquire funding was reduced because automatically you come with the prejudice of, you know, being less credible. And this also comes with products as well. But, but then again, these products need a chance. So I think we also have to push against the stigma. There has to be some believers at least. And then when these believers try the African products and then they see that it's a reliable product, it's a credible product, and then they put you out there this is going to, to, to move things forward. When we started with Remedy for fundraising, so a lot of the African VCs initially were like, we don't understand what you're doing. We're not just to do to biotech. And uh, from a credibility perspective, we're a little bit, you know, not confident. Go get some sort of a credibility stamp. So we filed a US patent. So this for us was like one credibility stamp because it's a US patent, not because the US patent honestly will protect our, our technology in Egypt or in Africa, but because credibility. And um, unfortunately, to be able, you know, to gain credibility in Africa, we went and got an EU stamp. So with that, uh, you refer to like uh, the MRA uh, hubs, let's say like in Kagala, South Africa being built. Uh, how does leveraging this technology kind of become a crucial point in terms of uh, like improving uh, the uh, independence of having our own uh, facilities within Africa? 
I think this is a huge step moving forward because mRNA technology is not just used for vaccines, but like for cancer therapy and for therapy of a lot of genetic diseases. And uh, once we have the technology, we are able to cater for our own problems. There are a lot of genetic diseases, for instance, that are inherent uh, in, in specific regions in Africa. And uh, in that sense, then we would own the technology to develop the solutions for the diseases that are, I mean, concentrated in specific African regions rather than wait. For example, there is this uh, disease, um, Tramedian Mediterranean fever. This is mainly abundant in North Africa and parts of the GCC region. If you look at the tests, for example, from uh, Western suppliers, they're very, very limited because it's not, you know, a, a broad disease, a widespread disease. Mm -hmm. But if we own the technology to address our own issues, then this would also take us, uh, it will also be a big game changer for us. Okay, so, so as we kind of reach like the, the ending of our conversation, looking ahead, how can African countries hold uh, like build sustainable healthcare ecosystems and prioritize local manufacturing and innovation. And what are some of the long-term potential goals that you see happening? Let's say the MRA's uh, ecosystem being built within Africa. How can we grab this, uh, like a opportunity that COVID gave us in seeing that we are too independent with the weights and world when we have issues. So when the next pandemic comes around, we are fully equipped with the facilities to look at our to, to look at all issues and fix them at, at a speedy pace rather than relying on waste and powers to be like, oh, now you can get vaccines. So I, th I think uh, a lot can be done on, on several aspects. So, so first of all, visibility is, is a very big thing. A lot of African companies are doing a lot of great things and they can help each other because they can complement what one another does. But again, we don't know about each other. So the creation of a given platform that puts, you know, these companies out there within a given field, or for example, that if I am doing something and I see I need help with this certain aspect, then if I can put out this request or requesting help in that, this a platform will do wonders in connecting um, African startups together. The second thing is, I would say on the regulatory level, uh, regulation in Africa is still pretty much isolated. There is no like common regulation. With the, there are a lot of initiatives like the Comesa and all of that. But again, when it comes to regulation, uh, it's still you know very isolated. And for example, for me in Egypt, it is very hard to understand what the regulation in Nigeria, for instance, looks like. Looks like I need to reach someone within the ecosystem who is in within what uh, doing something that's similar that I'm doing to be able to have this conversation with. And for me to do so, it comes with, you know, competition. What are you doing? Uh, where is this benefit going? So also in terms of openness uh, and aligning like regulatory requirements for different African uh, companies within different countries to work together, this is something that would also help. I think also the support system on the investment side, uh, I think what we've seen in Egypt with the majority of the investors looking into tech based companies that, you know, only use SaaS and uh, I would say, I don't want to call it soft technology, but, you know, the, the other kind of technology, mm -hmm. but, um, but education and the sense of the potential, not just in bringing good and impact, but also the financial potential that can come out from companies that are building products and the appetite for investment in such companies would also go a long way because yes, if you connect the companies, if you ease the regulation, but if you don't, you know, finance these companies, how are they going to work? Yeah, yeah that's true. So this is generally the question that I, I ask everyone before I uh, end of the podcast. And it's in terms of what advice would you give to inspiring entrepreneurs that are looking at the ecosystem, they're looking in Africa, they're like, oh, I have a great idea. I don't know what to do. How, what advice would you offer to, to, to those individuals? You would say resilient. Don't take the easy way out. You are going to fall head first in a lot of mud, but uh, you have to, you know, like wash your face and move on. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's very challenging, very, very challenging, but I would say that it's also very rewarding. So I think resilience is, and believe in yourself. Yes, we always, we don't necessarily always believe in ourselves. Uh, a lot of the days when I wake up in the morning, I really, really feel like an imposter. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm an academic. I should just be, you know, like teaching my students and publishing papers. But then when you get good feedback, when you see that your products are used, when you see that you can actually help people, it's actually like, no, I'm, I'm, I can do it. So 
if I can do it, then other people can do it. I'm not special. It's just, you know, you just put the effort and you try and you do your best. Hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. And uh, if people want to reach out to you, where can they find you? If investors want to reach out to you, where, where do they find you? So LinkedIn, our website, and uh, I, I can put my contacts uh, anywhere and I'm, I'm happy to speak to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so yeah, that is it from us and uh, look us up in the next episode. Yeah.